Welcome to our second panel. There are a few changes. Um, Eric Stone from Fresh Direct, unfortunately, just informed us he cannot attend. Um, so we're going to have uh, three speakers. We're going to have a little more time to talk. And we'll take a little break so that we can get ready also for the keynote speaker uh, when Massimo Bottura arrives. Uh, the other change, Marcel Van Uyen also couldn't attend, but Michael Horvitz from uh, um, Grow NYC is participating. Uh, Michael, let me introduce the speakers, and I need my glasses. Uh, Michael is the director of the Green Market Program of Grow NYC. Uh, it's a 41-year-old program that operates 52 producer-only farmers markets throughout the five boroughs of New York City. In this, in this role, Michael created the Farm Roots Technical Assistance Program, institutionalized the Healthy Exchange Food Access Initiative, and is now working with a team to build the New York Regional Food Hub. Michael, uh, is studied at UPenn and at Cardozo. He came to food from a social work perspective. So he comes with very specific um, experiences and approaches, and we're very happy to have him here. Uh, other uh, speaker is Elizabeth Balkan, who is Director of Policy and Senior Advisor to the Commissioner at the New York City Department of Sanitation. Somebody before already mentioned their work, so here we are. In this role, Elizabeth has been responsible for developing and implementing the city's zero waste plan. Previously, uh, Elizabeth worked on long-term planning and sustainability at the mayor's office. Before joining the city, she lived and worked in China for more than a decade, researching solid waste planning in China and running an energy and environmental consulting firm. Elizabeth has worked extensively with cities to make sustainable development a viable option for both developed and emerging economies. Last but not least, of course, Thomas McQuillan, who's director of food service sales and sustainability at Baldor Specialty Foods, and we just discovered that we lived probably uh, one mile from each other in Rome, a small world. We figured it out yesterday. Um, Thomas is a food sustainability leader, a chef, and an innovator in systems and operation. He has 20 years plus years, uh, 25 years, sorry, of successful business leadership experience, uh, developing different strategic initiatives and turning companies around. In 2015, uh, he joined Baldur Specialty Food. Um, he was brought in to handle special projects, uh, and the first one was to identify a cost-effective way to repurpose the overwhelming amount of food byproduct created by the company's Fresh Cuts facility. Thomas created a sustainability initiative called Sparks, which is scraps spelled backwards, to reinvent the way people feel about unused food. He completely eliminated food waste from Baldur's facility within a year's time, and the revolutionary program has served as a template for other corporations across the country. So this is gonna be a very interesting panel. Here from, the, the, from zooming in, let's say, inside the restaurant, we're looking at the systems. And I think it's a very important uh, shift uh, that we need to do to fully understand the food, uh, the food waste issue. Um, before we were talking about policies, just as an introduction, I would like to mention that uh, in July, three years ago, uh, the European Commission, that's where I'm from, uh, launched a set of ideas about implementing the circular economy as much as possible in different industries of Europe. And by circular economy, they um, mean using the output of a specific supply chain as input for other chains. And so the European Union is trying to promote this approach to all sorts of industries, not only the food, but I think when it comes to food, this is particularly important. And we've already been discussing um, these aspects in the, first, uh, in the first panel. I would invite uh, Michael to start uh, presenting his work and 
they will take turns, and then, as before, we'll have discussions among the panelists, and then we will open it uh, to everybody. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Fabio. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, the director of Green Market, which is a program of a larger nonprofit, Grow NYC. Uh, we were founded 42 years ago with a two-part mission. In the 15 years leading up to our creation, we lost about, about 300,000 acres of farmland in the Hudson Valley alone. And it was near impossible to find a good tomato in New York City, regardless of what neighborhood you came from. So our, farm, <clears throat> our founders spent the year from 1975 to 1976 to convince 12 farmers to come into the city and try to sell what, they're what they were growing on their, on their farms. Today, we work with about 250 producers. Our region is 250 miles to the north, 170 miles east and west, and 120 miles to the south. Uh, and we are a producer-only farmer's market, 52 locations throughout the five boroughs, 2,600 individual markets annually. Here's a shot of that first day in New York. Some, most people think that Union Square was the first market. It was our second market. It was our largest flagship market. Uh, Two-thirds of our producers sell there on one of the four days that we operate. But this is actually on 59th Street and 2nd Avenue, which is now a, um, a residential building. And our farmers were sold out by 11 o'clock in the morning. And the joke that we tell is that one farmer went back to his father in New Jersey, and the father said, is there some famine in New York City that we don't know about? <laughs> and there, obviously there was not, but there really was very limited access to regionally grown agriculture. And that's what we were created to do. And I heard the term ugly fruit and ugly produce in the last panel. We call this our norm. And our markets serve as vital outlets for products that traditionally many wholesalers would not carry those products. 85% of our farmers would tell you that they would be out of business without the opportunity to sell directly to you and keep that, re that food dollar, the, the overwhelming majority of that food dollar, in their pocket. Here's another example of some of that imperfect uh, tomato that we th actually think is, is rather gorgeous. And it's not just limited to produce. Here's a, a sea robin, so, you know, sustainably caught seafood. Some would call this trash fish, others would call it bycatch. We call it affordable lobster. <clears throat> I could spend the next three hours talking about this slide alone. This is the black dirt region of New York City, 65 miles from here, it's the second largest glacial lake deposit to the Everglades. This could play a significant role in feeding New York City. Um, I use this example, this is Stanley Osipinski. He was a third generation onion farmer. His family monocropped onions in the black dirt region and the market bottomed out and they were left with very stark decisions to make. He was convinced to bring some vegetables down from his three-acre garden uh, and sell them in, in the city. Stanley now has 350 varieties of product. His three children are involved in the business. He's been selling in Washington Heights since 1977, in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, to his, his Polish community, in fact, um, for decades, and obviously is, a, is, at, is at Union Square as well. Part of our responsibility as a nonprofit promoting regional agriculture, working for an environmental organization, is helping people not only stretch their food dollar, but also to have make sm large impacts on the environment with very simple methods. So here is, you know, and that's part of the education that we do daily at our markets through cooking demonstrations, the recipes that we distribute. Here's carrot top pesto explaining you, that, those products that you are buying, it's not just that what's at the bottom of that bunch, but what's also within that rubber band can make some beautiful product, beautifully tasting, wonderful, healthy food. Here's also in us teaching people how to can and how to extend what they're purchasing. And in fact, some people can go to market towards the end of the day and buy tomatoes that otherwise may be composted or, or um, or donated, or if it's sitting on your in your on your countertop, and you know it's about it's overripe, 
there are things that you can do other than turn that into food waste. And of course, uh, at the end of each day, we donate what food that is not going to be processed or stored back on the farm. Last year, 40 of our markets donated to 50 food rescue organizations a little over 1.1 million, million pounds of food, um, and our wholesale operation and another about another million pounds. We've been incredibly successful uh, in working with our farmers. We started with 12 growers. We now have 250 growers. We have 51,000 acres of farmland represented in our market. We have nearly 12,000 individual variety of product represented in our market. And farmers markets have exploded over the last 10 years. And despite that growth and despite our success, we continue to lose farmland at alarming rates in our country and in this state and in our region. And a big reason for that is we're losing mid-sized farms. Farms that are too large to come and set up on the sidewalk and sell by the bunch, but who aren't so large that it's super efficient and they're not sending tractor trailers to wholesalers. And when you lose a 500 acre farm, it's a disproportionate impact than if you're losing a five acre farm or, or a seven acre farm. So after 30, what, 30 years of successfully opening these retail markets, we decided that we would enter into the wholesale game. Um, and we, huh, it was the, one of the craziest decisions you make is when you volunteer to buy trucks and start renting warehouse space. Um, but again, it's our two-part mission. It's keeping small farms or medium-sized local, local farms viable, increased farmer profitability, and ensuring that those products are equitably distributed throughout the five boroughs. You know, we have farmers markets in all income, through, in those 52 locations, that they're thriving in all income levels. Uh, we want to make sure that, the, that our wholesale food is going to, into those same places. So we now are working with about 60 farmers, 85% come from New York State. Uh, last year, what we started with 12 borrowed pallet spaces in City Harvest Warehouse. We now have a small 5,000 square foot warehouse in the, in the Bronx. We've been able to remove fruits and vegetables, some value added, honey, maple syrup, and we also distribute regional grains from 22 growers and, and local mills. 65% um, of the three million pounds that we distributed last year went to underserved areas. This is institutions, this is senior centers, food pantries, our own food access initiatives that we operate, our, our youth run farm stands, our cooperative buying food box models. Um, and we're also distributing to high end restaurants, the, the uh, Gramercy Taverns of the world, and, everything in between, but it is our, our mission and our intent, intent to do this work with the farmer and the equitable distribution in mind. And that's why we entered into the wholesale game. And here you can see that our, who our, our buyers are from our own food access programs, institutions, restaurants, and retailers. Institutions play a key role because they are able, because they are processing, they are able to be creative with what we're, what we're bringing to them. And we, our pallets that we break up we break up by the case, not individual bunches. So the same food that's going to Gramercy Tavern is going to the Queensboro houses in Queens. Um, in recognition of our growth and of the need to support our regional agriculture system and the lack of infrastructure that exists to do that, we, uh, this past summer, Governor Cuomo announced that he was contributing $15 million to help us build a New York regional food hub. This will take, we will be building uh, about a 70,000 square foot distribution facility in the old, new, in the uh, new Fulton fish market auxiliary lot, actually adjacent to where, where Bowdoin is. Construction will start, will break ground next October. We'll take about a third of it and there will be another distributor uh, focused on regional agriculture and also the, the last third will be for uh, local processing. So that's sort of the picture of who we are in terms of how we're bringing food into the city and, and getting it uh, into New Yorkers. I'll turn it over to back to Fabio and ask all the questions throughout. Thanks very much. Any chefs in the room could stand up and be recognized. Chefs, sous chefs, executive chefs, any chefs in the room? Could you stand up, please? We got two, three, five, 10, 20, 50. All chefs, please stand. Round of applause for our chefs, please.
We are not going to solve the food waste issue in our country without our chefs. Just as we brought organics to the market 25 years ago, we will solve this issue with our chef partners. They will communicate to their constituents and stakeholders the importance of this. They will introduce it through their restaurants, and we will make change together. So we very much look forward to working with all of you. Um, Baldor Specialty Foods, just a quick overview. We are a food distributor in New York, now a competitor of Green NYC. I'm glad I came to get that competitive analysis. Um, <laughs> We distribute, 75% uh, of the food we distribute is produce, 25% is specialty food. That would be anything other than a fruit or a vegetable. Within our fruit and vegetable uh, world, we produce, through a company called Fresh Cuts, a million two hundred thousand pounds of fresh produce every week. We're cutting it into carrot sticks and diced onions and mirepoix. And as a result of that production, we generate about 170,000 pounds of sparks. Um, our goal as a company is to put all 170,000 pounds of those sparks to use as a food item. And very quickly today, we're going to walk through that journey together. Um, we're not going to watch the video. Um, this is an image of a, a um, garbage dump or landfill located uh, not too far from here in, in, in uh, Central America, just behind a, a, um, a resort. It's indifferent where it is. It's just the fact that, you know, that we could take what probably is recyclable material, probably all 100% of it, um, and that we would create this, what will be ultimately a disaster when the next storm rolls around. Uh, you may have seen this. Uh, if you've seen me present before, you've certainly seen this. But this is a 30-year-old um, infogram that does a very good job of indicating what the different products are that go to landfill every day from us as residents and as restaurants and distributors. Um, the percentages of the food product has increased dramatically to about arguably 25 to 31 percent. So it's considerably larger portion of the pie than what you see here. Um, but paper still remains, cardboard, et cetera, still remains a very large portion of that. And I would argue that there isn't anything in this pie that we couldn't figure out another use for. So we need to do that. The food hierarchy, Elizabeth uh, Melt stole my thunder. Thank you, Elizabeth, if you're in the room. But this is the hierarchy. Let's keep looking at this. Let's keep thinking about whether or not we recognize that the top end of this pyramid is our number one goal, or somewhere mid or towards the end, but understand that this is what we need to be thinking about when we want to come up with a solution for our organizations. For Baldor, our goal is to feed people. We are a distributor of food. We are not a farm, we are not a restaurant, we are the two in farm to fork, and that's all we want to be. These are sparks. Um, so sparks, as I mentioned, are any of the remaining food products from production. We challenge certain chef partners who we work with um, to use these food products for use as consumable goods. So if you look at the pineapple, for example, um, there's all kinds of things you could do with that. But one of the things that I like to think about is uh, we see these dispensaries for water, diffused water, in a lot of hotel lobbies. And invariably, the fruit that they use to, diffuse, to infuse the water is a cut lime or a cut lemon or some other whole piece of fruit cut up. And unfortunately, that fruit probably gets wasted. In this case, we can reuse that, or not even reuse, but use for the first time this beautiful pineapple to infuse that water and get another uh, use out of it. So we're excited about those opportunities. And then all the other food products we like to see used as food products whenever possible. This is our dried vegetable blend. We take 20 of the vegetables that come off our production line and we create this blend that's then crushed and created into that uh, sort of like a oregano size uh, product. It's flavorful and delicious. It's full of vitamin A and C and phosphorus and ash and folic acid and um, fiber. And it can be added to meatballs or uh, spread on top of a roasted vegetable or chicken. And it's really delicious. And it introduces a nutrient-dense product but that would otherwise be wasted. So we're really excited about this product. And we're hoping to make this available to the public in June. And since you're videotaping me, I guess we got to make that happen. Uh, we had a competition about a year ago with some students from Drexel University's Food Lab. They come up with these wonderful food items using the dried vegetable blend. The winning item was a chicken thigh dredged in dried vegetable blend and then flour. The chef was 
aware of the fact that the, the vegetable would ash, and so she used the flour to protect the vegetable powder, vegetable, dried vegetable blend, and then she also infused it into that biscuit, and one for her creativity and the delicious nature of the food, and the idea that such a large amount of vegetable blend is now introduced into a chicken product, which you can imagine all the benefits of that. Misfit Juiceries, big partner of ours, they take our carrot tips, for example, and make a, their carrot, 24 karat gold drink, which you see here. Um, Christina Bl uh, Briscoe, who's one of my colleagues at Baldor, she's here today, um, somewhere in the audience. Uh, she's working with them, them now to create new juices using romaine outer leaves, and she could tell you a little bit more about that if you're interested. But her goal is to put as many products that are sparks into their juices as possible. She's a trained chef so we can take advantage of her creative talents, take these Sparks products and get, make a delicious juice for you to enjoy. Baldor's local pledge does exactly what, what we were just introduced to, this idea that we need to bring more local farms to Baldor, uh, to New York City, excuse me. So what we do is we partner with local farms. They have to meet very strict food safety regulations that we impart on them. Um, they have to uh, be able to have some kind of scale to make sure that because of the question we were asked before, to make sure that there is enough food so that when a chef puts an item on their menu, they can be confident we're gonna have it for them. But if you take the local pledge as a restaurant, you commit to paying up to 10% more for any food item that you buy from us that's available local. So if you buy a conventional broccoli and we have local broccoli, you're gonna get the local broccoli. Um, on, at the same time, we post on our website, and I'd encourage you to look at it, all the restaurants that are now part of our local pledge. And as a consumer, you click on them, see who they are, go and eat at their restaurant and tell them, you took the local pledge, we appreciate that. And I'm proud to say that our fastest growing part of our business is the number of locally grown products that we bring to market during the growing season. So that's super cool. I think I'm done. Oh, <laughs> there's my cow. I love that cow. So thank you for listening and I look forward to taking your questions. Hi everyone, I'll ask you to bear with me. I'm a little bit hoarse today, but um, I'm extremely excited to be here and really pleased by everyone's enthusiasm. Uh, I'm from the Department of Sanitation, as mentioned, so clearly you must be asking why uh, someone who works in uh, squarely on the waste side of things and the operational side of things is here. I'm gonna tell you exactly what we're up to. Uh, first, for those that don't know, uh, and I do think it's important when we're talking about the issue to back up a little bit and talk about our waste stream in general uh, and not just food waste, here's the breakdown, a very broad breakdown of what we throw away every year. Um, as you can see, it's about a third of your conventional recyclables, that's metal, glass, plastic, and paper. Um, it's about a third organic waste, as mentioned, and uh, it's about 30% other. I'm gonna skip for today kind of the, this could be a whole uh, thesis worth of explanation of what's in that other and, and how problematic a lot of that material is and what we're doing to address it. Um, but then there's also 6% textiles and 1% e-waste. Equally important is the fact that in New York City alone, residents generate 3 million tons of waste per year. That's the household portion of waste. Businesses generate the same amount. Uh, so you're talking about citywide, both on the commercial side and the residential side, um, a just astronomical amount of, of waste generated. The Department of Sanitation has embraced our zero waste goal, that is to send zero waste to landfill by 2030. Uh, this was announced in 2015. And to get there, I think we know that we need to develop uh, programs and solutions across the waste stream. Every slice of the pie, as we like to say, uh, needs to have an outlet. Or if there is a not, not a good outlet for things like styrofoam, plastic bags, then we need to get them out of the waste stream. Equally important, uh, as I'll talk about a little, is reducing overall what we generate. Um, we know that it's much, much easier uh, to uh, recycle or to 
compost or to find other solutions for things uh, that don't exist. And too often, I think as a department, uh, and being such an operations-oriented department, we, um, we're left with, with what's in the bin, right? So yes, we can develop programs to try to make things, um, to try to recycle and to reuse things that are there, but uh, the preferred solution, um, as was shown with the food waste hierarchy, is to prevent waste before it happens. We don't, we don't want it. And that's part of the conversations that we're having um, with uh, manufacturers and with other partners along the supply chain to improve industrial design uh, and to prevent waste from happening in the first place. This is a photo on the left which I just love it, and so I had to put it in here. Um, someone who does some archival work uh, in the department found it. It's from 1929. Um, and I think it's really remarkable because I think we, you know, organics diversion, a lot of people in New York have either not seen it at all happening or they think of it as something that is very, very new to New York City. Um, and yes, the way that we're rolling it out is new and it's ambitious. And um, if you've lived in other cities uh, over abroad or perhaps in San Francisco or on the West Coast, you're, you've wondered, uh, why doesn't New York do that? Um, but we have a history of doing it, right? And I think for many, many years, the food scraps from New York City were taken to pig farms. Um, so there is a sense of um, a history there. Um, of course, when you look at the picture on the right, you realize that we're very much reinventing the way that we are uh, doing organics uh, collection and diversion from landfill today. Um, I'm very proud to say that on the residential side, we are now uh, the largest organics diversion program in the country. Uh, we've recently surpassed our one millionth uh, resident who is receiving uh, curbside uh, organics collection. We will reach 3.3 million New Yorkers by the end of this year, and then in 2018, we'll finish the city off. So if you haven't seen a brown bin, if you haven't uh, had organics rolled out into your neighborhood, uh, you will likely have that happen very soon. And I think as important as it is to uh, talk about what needs to be done on the commercial side, uh, you know, the, the first step is, is looking at your own waste stream and, and being part of that change in terms of your own household habits. Um, that said, what, what I can add to this discussion is that um, for the city has made these very public commitments to go uh, citywide with organics. Um, and that means that we're developing, uh, you know, the uh, operational capacity through our equipment, through our fleet, um, through the way that we develop our routes, and to make sure that we can serve all New Yorkers and collect the material. But that's only one part of the, of the puzzle. The other very important part of the puzzle is the outlets. Where does this material go? How can we ensure that what we're, that, that what we're collecting from New Yorkers um, does get, have a place to go besides landfill? And that infrastructure question is really a critical piece of this conversation. Um, so I want to talk a little bit now about our commercial uh, organics mandates. I think what we did in 2013 is um, pass a law that requires some uh, certain large food waste generating businesses to divert their organics. Now, why this is important, again, as I showed just there, we're expecting there to be a lot more material that needs to get diverted from landfill. We need a place to put it. This is a big infrastructure question. This is something Elizabeth Meltz uh, kind of teed up for me last, set, last panel, is that um, you need to have the infrastructure. And there needs to be a demand coming not from just from the city, but also from the commercial side. Um, so what the commercial organics mandate will do is require that certain large businesses take part in this program um, and get their food out of the landfill. Uh, just very briefly to go over who's covered, uh, the law applies to uh, certain businesses according to their square footage. Uh, so that's food manufacturers, food wholesalers, food retail or supermarkets and food preparation, as well as certain large generators that are, um, that are uh, 
broken out by their uh, capacity. So it would be catered events, uh, serving 100 people, or more food service in hotels for a hun with 100 rooms, uh, and stadiums, stadiums and arenas with 15,000 seats. So because we don't have the uh, adequate capacity to cover all these establishments or to, to cover all of the food waste that these establishments generate right now, we are rolling out the bill or implementing the law uh, in tiers. And so right now we have these four groups that are covered by the law. Um, the law is already in effect. The uh, warning period has already expired. So everyone is expected to be in compliance. These are larger hotels, so 150 rooms or more, uh, food manufacturers, food wholesalers, and stadiums and arenas. Um, and these groups alone, I think, represent a huge portion of the food waste that we're seeing coming out of the commercial side, but also these are the, the players, unlike, say, a small restaurant that are um, potentially, hopefully, more equipped to make adjustments in their uh, waste programs, waste management programs, to uh, be able to be in compliance. And, and like Thomas has talked about, what our hope is is that businesses see this as an opportunity not just to shift what is being collected by a refuse hauler to an organics hauler, although, although that is an important part of the solution, but rather that folks uh, in this world start to understand and apply all of the solutions that are available um, and which work up the food waste hierarchy in terms of finding ways to feed people, finding ways to feed animals, uh, and obviously finding ways to prevent food waste altogether. Um, with that, I want to introduce the Food Waste Fair. This is how we uh, are going to get that information and get those resources, deliver those resources to New York City businesses. Um, this is an event we're holding this summer. We really want businesses to come out, operators to come out to understand how they can both prevent and reduce as well as beneficially reuse their food waste and, and really to showcase and catalyze innovation across the full range of solutions. Uh, this is an emerging economy. There's a lot of opportunity here from, I think investors have their eye on this market and businesses should take advantage of that. We hope that they uh, come out and learn all there is to know and can take that information back into their place of business and really apply it. Um, so you have here kind of a breakdown. It's going to be an expo style. So we'll have a huge amount of um, exhibitors from across different industries talking about their goods and services. And uh, as I said, very practical hands-on workshops talking about regulations, talking about um, how to implement some of these solutions in your restaurant or supermarket uh, operationally, possible financing options and incentives. Um, so that's the food waste fair. There's flyers outside on the table. Um, please take one or get in touch with me if you want to learn more. Thank you very much. Thank you. There is so much uh, to talk about. It's 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 very very rich. Um, I would like to open it as soon as possible to the audience. We've seen that there is a lot of um, interest in participating. I would just like to ask you, you know, this, these implementations require a lot of um, changes of mentality in all the stakeholders involved, going from producers to uh, sort of the middlemen to the final users. Um, what have been the major challenges that you've encountered, and this is a question for everybody, in implementing these, these innovations, and how have you dealt with them? I'll say that I think a major challenge is when you ask, when, when you open up a discussion about food waste, no matter who you're talking to, a business or a, a resident, um, usually people say, I don't waste food. I don't have food waste. So I think that's a really major thing we need to uh, acknowledge and, and, and understand to, in order to make progress in this. And that, I think, is part of the overall perception of waste, right? I think waste is something that people, it's not comfortable, right? And that's part of the reason why we have so much landfill waste is because it's easier to get something away from you than to really spend the time with it to continue you know, sorting it and touching it and thinking about it or storing it in your apartment, that's not something that people want to do. And so I think psychologically, 
um, there's this real disconnect with with waste, and and I think it's it's hard to um, you know it's hard to overcome that. I also think the idea that um, you know some of the things that are 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 called waste are not waste, as as Thomas has talked about, as one of the other panelists talked about in, in their slides, and so I think it's also you know part of the journey is to um, you know, redefine what's edible and really try to push people to the limit to, to accept that. Um, this is a great question because at, if you work with me at Baldor, no matter who you are, you may not use the word food and W together. I have a few colleagues here today, they'll tell you that I do not tolerate that at Baldor. We are a food company, we sell food, it's all edible. There are food products that when they are no longer edible need to be managed some way. Ali Forstman asked a, great, uh, asked a question and made a comment about composting of these orga this organic matter. That never makes that product waste. It is not waste. It's, an, it's a wonderfully rich, nutrient-dense product that we need to reclaim our soil. There is no waste. And I don't even like to see the word food W on a panel that I'm speaking on because I don't buy into that. Sparks was created to change the narrative. Sparks does that. You want to buy the food product that results from our production to create a carrot stick, you buy a carrot spark. And so that's really helped us move the conversation away from thinking that we're creating a food product out of garbage and to think about creating a food product, looking at all of our assets and gleaning the greatest value of all those assets, our food, our energy, and all the other items that we used to treat as waste that we now recycle, repurpose, and reuse because it's now part of the Baldor culture. But to answer your question, the greatest challenge are you know, the internal processes that exist and bringing everyone on board in a company with 1,500 employees to buy into it. And we've been able to do that. I think that some of the greatest barriers are the, are the limitations we put on ourselves, either as a business, as an organization or as a, as a public entity. Because what I think the three of us have demonstrated is that once you are intentional about something and you make the, put the processes in place, people do it. And it's not that difficult. 10 years ago, we had food scrap collections at two markets. We now have food scrap collections at 43 and 1.1 million New Yorkers can have access to residential food waste. It's because you put the systems in place and then you run with it and you make it easier and you break down those barriers through constant education and by creating the efficiencies. So I think once we get out of our own way, it's, it gets pretty easy. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, I have another question, but if you have questions, could you please uh, start uh, lining up at the microphones? Um, so uh, this panel, it's about systems, about a holistic approach to these issues. Um, what are the, let's say, non-food issues that have been the, the largest challenges at the, from the point of view of logistics, transportation, labor, what's, what is uh, that you feel it's sort of that big issue that needs to be addressed from? From, our, my, from my perspective, it's packaging. You know, we need to be much more responsible in the way we move our food around the country our president, Michael Muzak, talks about the fact that 80% of all the food produced in the United States is produced west of the Mississippi, 80% is consumed east of the Mississippi. And so if we know we're going to have to move all this food product that far, how can we do it in such a way that eliminates packaging? Do we need wax cardboard? Can we eliminate ice? How can we take ice in the state of California, who yeah, last year was in, a, in, was in this horrible drought, to create ice, to pack broccoli, to then pack in a bag, to put in a, a wax box. The product gets to, the, to New York, it gets to our chef partners, and they have nothing to do that they can do with that wax cardboard box. That's just completely unforgivable. So I look at it as an opportunity to work on a national level with competitors alike to come up with a solution around wax cardboard. We simply need to stop creating wax cardboard, move to RPCs collectively, which can make their way back in a responsible way to California to be reused again. So packaging for me is a big issue. Well, I think for regional farms, 
where the cost of production, the cost of land is exponentially higher than the rest of the country. <clears throat> Our farms are smaller than, than the Midwest and the, and the West Coast. It's building in the efficiencies, um, identifying existing infrastructure that exists that can be, be utilized and uh, farms working together to fill single trucks. Um, one of the greatest barriers is that there is a concept that food should be cheap. And um, with cheap food, how, do, how then do you expect to have a food system that in supports the land, that supports the people who are growing that yeah. food? Um, so it's, we're competing against some of the, with the Hunts Point Produce Co-op, some of the cheapest food in the Northeast in our backyard. So I think it's, it's connect, again, connecting the dots, educating consumers, providing efficiencies so that some food can compete, but also um, sort of changing the conversation about what our food system looks like, uh, that we should be paying the true cost of food, right? Uh, understanding that there is a dead zone the size of Michigan in the, in the Gulf of Mexico because we are not paying the true cost of food and, and making the, those connections and investing in, in our food system. Um, so I've sort of rambled the, my, my answer because I, I think that there are a significant number of challenges that we're up, up against in terms of seeing more local food get into our system. I think the food pledge that Baldor is doing is, to hear that is fantastic. And I think that there are more and more culinary professionals that understand yeah. the relationship between seasonal food and taste. And I also think that there is a, we as a consumer body, again in the last 10 years, much, uh, are much more aware of the relationship between how our food is grown and how it impacts our bodies and our environment. Thank you. Will you reconsider not becoming a distributor? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> I had a try. Our trucks will be carrying each other's products. If all works out well for us, then, that, then that's what the system looks like. We, we've been talking with Baldor for years. We, we run a small, there are 11 guys, half of whom are over 75, that between 2 a.m. to 8 a.m., Tuesday through Saturday, from April through November, sell by the case out of their truck uh, in, our, in our current location. They are the remaining 12 wholesale growers from the old Bronx terminal market. And we've, we fully believe that having infrastructure in Hunts Point, where trucks are already going, and um, enabling more and more local farmers to have access to that infrastructure in the Bronx will only for activate. It's going to give Baldor more opportunity to purchase local, other distributors that are already there to cross dock, and and that's why we're why we're building this infrastructure, it's truly dedicated to our region's growers. Yeah, so <clears throat> I'll just add, as I said before, infrastructure is key. Um, as Elizabeth Meltz talked about, the, the current um, economic structure is totally in reverse of what it should be. It is more expensive uh, oftentimes to divert your food waste uh, for um, being processed in a compost facility than to landfill it, even though the Northeast has some of the highest landfill costs um, in the country. So which is a good thing. I think in other parts of the country, you've got landfill fees that are so low that it's almost impossible to introduce um, diversion uh, programs. But the way that we turn that relationship, turn the, um, transpose the, the cost associated with uh, food waste diversion is to, is to get that infrastructure online. Um, when you continue to back up and say, well, why isn't it there? It comes back to the demand. If there's a demand for the infrastructure, if someone who wants to build a facility can say to a bank or to a lender, um, I am 100% certain that I will get uh, a delivery, enough delivery, enough um, you know, feedstock to, to power this anaerobic digestion plan or to power or to keep the compost facility going. Um, if they can do that, then they can build facilities and those facilities become cheaper uh, for operators and for haulers to use. Um, but that demand needs to be there. And again, I think it goes back to the commercial organics law, which is is a market, it's a very much government intervention meant to stimulate that market development and get that infrastructure going by producing a demand. Um, 
so I think that's absolutely critical, and it's often called the chicken or the egg problem, which is, um, oh yeah, I would compost if there was a place to put it, and then the, you know, that's what that's what someone who's generating the food waste might say, where the facility says, I would build a facility if there was someone who would give it give me that feedstock. So that's the that's the problem we're trying to solve. Um, I would I will say on the food waste recovery food recovery side of things, transportation is a real issue. Um, so I think there's some great, I know there's some great companies and apps out there. Um, rescuing Leftover Cuisine is one where if you have edible food, uh, they, they uh, mobilize a huge network of volunteers who will help get that food to the place that needs it. Um, you'll hear from City Harvest tomorrow, which um, does a tremendous job, but I know that they have issues with transportation because there's often this thing of, you know, and not just the transportation resources, but also the timing in terms of when food might come to a distribution center and when it needs to get taken away. And if, if it's not taken away in the time frame needed, it, it, needs to be, it needs to be thrown out. So those logistical issues are incredibly important. Thank you. So we have around 10 minutes for question and answer. I would ask both our uh, audience and the speakers to, uh, to keep it concise. We have our first question. Thank you. Uh, this microphone, please. Uh, hold on, because we need to record you. This, this microphone, please. Yes, there you go. Hi. I'm Adam from uh, a small hold. We're an ag tech company and uh, the only mushroom farm in, in New York City. Uh, my question is actually pretty tactical. Um, we, we did an experiment with a high-end grocery store a while ago where uh, sometimes we grow mushrooms and they don't look that good. They look like kind of like Oompa Loompas or, or King Oysters. Uh, and we put those on a shelf actually next to some really fine looking King Oysters and they did not sell. Um, so from a tactical level, how can we address people's perception of produce and food that might otherwise go to waste? And those are perfectly good mushrooms, by the way. They, they, they taste great. So, Thank thanks. you. So, you know, part of the education has to be that there are all kinds of food items we don't eat that we can eat. And, and mushrooms scare people. In the United States, we're scared. We can't forage mushrooms. They might kill us. We, we, we're really fearful of mushrooms. So you have an obligation as a mushroom grower in Brooklyn, of all places, the only one I just heard in New York City. How cool is that? I gotta, that's great. Um, to educate us about the king mushroom, that it can grow bigger. To educate us that kiwi skins are edible and delicious. To educate us that we can eat banana skins. To educate us that really most food products that are fruits and vegetables, the tops of beets, the tops of carrots, the peel, this is all edible. What is edible? What do we have to do to, to make it edible? And that education, we're starved for that education. So please help us understand that that large king oyster is in fact an edible and delicious food item that we need to, to, to eat. So thank you. You know, I didn't eat celeriac uh, until I saw one of our market managers cooking it on the corner of 57th Street and 9th Avenue explaining to, and I was the director of Green Market at the time, explaining to me how to prepare it and to taste it. And once I saw again how simple it was and how delicious it was, it became a staple in my house. And whether that's the difference between a farmer's market and a strict retail, I mean, I go to retail shops all the time and, and sample product. And I think it's the sampling and the breaking down of those barriers along with the education that would be crucial. So if people could do a taste test side by side of you, what you're growing compared to what's been sitting on that shelf probably for, or packaged and traveled for a long time, I'm sure they wouldn't, wouldn't even hesitate to buy the, what, you're, what you're growing. And then they hear the story behind it even better. So again, it's the, ed the education and the, the direct opportunity to interact with that product. I think education <clears throat> is critical, so is marketing. I think what Thomas has done with Sparks is brilliant. In the same way that very few of us would want to eat a dolphin fish, we love mahi-mahi, right? It's the same idea. So I think there needs to be a certain kind of packaging, not the packaging that Thomas and I share a, 
uh, hate for, but rather the way that things are presented to people to make them appealing. Um, the same thing is true when we go out and try to get uh, buildings enrolled for their organics collection service, and they say, no, no, no it's going to be smelly, it's going to attract rodents. First of all, it's the same. It's the same stuff that you've always that's always been coming out of your apartment. Nothing's changing. So if it's smelly now, it's going to be smelly. It's probably going to be less smelly when it's source separated. Um, but again, we also talk. We we talk about the benefits of using our bins to um, to collect and remove your food waste, which latch. Those are actually vermin proof and uh, lids that will or bins that will help reduce pests. So again, you really have to think about, and that's a different example, but I think you have to identify the things that will motivate people to change your behavior. In our case, it's not saying to New Yorkers the environmental benefits of our organics program. It's saying, we're gonna make roaches and rats less of a problem in your, in your apartment building. And that's something that I think gets across to people. So again, I think it, you know, that's what we, that's how we need to be thinking about things. How do we market it? How do we pitch it? Next question. Hi, I'm Allie Forsman from Recultivate New York, and I've sat with all three of your organizations, including Thomas, personally. Um, you know, we have 35,537 farms in the state of New York with an average acreage of 208 acres. That's your infrastructure, okay? Haulers just want to have a place to take it. And I just, I'm just curious, you know, in the overall structure, how do we keep that waste, which is now the oil well of the future, in the state of New York for each of your organizations? And I know, Michael, you're, you're you know, right now we're all consuming the food or we're processing waste, but what is going to be done from each of your organizations to support New York and to deal with the back half of that food cycle? I think... <clears throat> It's a really important question. We would love to see more farms um, taking the compostable materials. Um, it's complicated because a lot of the times what we get in the brown bins is not farm ready. I mean, there's a lot of contamination in it. There's plastic bags. There's sometimes we get um, ironing boards and <laughs> bath mats. I'm not kidding. And we've installed very robust processing, pre-processing equipment in our transfer stations, which is the place where the waste goes um, before it gets sent to a farm or to another facility to try to remove that contamination. Um, but it's very difficult, right? It's, it's a lot easier to, um, it's hard to unscramble an egg. Everyone knows that. So we don't, and, and we're also cognizant to, uh, we don't want farms to feel like we're assaulting them with our garbage. I think that's really important too. Um, so we absolutely want them to be part of the solution. We need to develop really good um, equipment to make sure that the material is um, delivered in the form that farms can utilize it. I also, um, We've seen certain haulers uh, have developed partnerships with farms to take their material, uh, and what they do is they invest in um, the screening and other equipment needed at the farm to, to get that material to be really pure. Um, that's, a, that's a tremendous innovation, and I, I'd love to see more of that. But, I mean, the, the, the nutrients in the food waste is, um, are critical for our soil, and so that's critical for our food systems. And I think we also need to make this linkage between um, you know, the value that compost gives for our sustainable food systems, but also that whenever you throw away something that's edible, potentially edible, um, you're wasting water and you're wasting, you know, you're wasting all the resources that went into that. So there's a, there's a climate change component that's not obviously, I think that to many is not um, always thought about or understood, and I think it's really critical that we start with that. So I would add that when those routes are ready, I certainly think we can be a convener of those farms and, and make those connections. In the meantime, our staff has been, as of the 43 locations that we collect food scraps from, uh, sanitation directly picks up from 15 and our staff collects and then picks up from 28 of them. That's going, what we're collecting is going to community gardens here in the city, community, really, 
through, and all of this is funded through sanitation, including much of the end users who are processing. A lot of them are volunteers who are showing up each week uh, and processing, that win creating windrows and, and turning that into black gold. Um, so we're, di are, we're directly getting our hands dirty by, by collecting the scraps, driving those trucks, um, educating consumers how to do it, and then we will be the convener when we are ready to do that. So Baldor Specialty Foods is zero organics to landfill from production. I was told a year ago we couldn't do it. I went to a conference at Stanford University in April of last year. I listened for two days to very large corporations, small corporations, talk about what they were doing in 2030. I got so sick to my stomach. At the end of the conference, I was given like two minutes to speak, and I said, Baldor Specialty Foods in 2016 will be zero organics to landfill from production. I got like a rousing applause. People were all excited. When I got back to New York and the president said to me, what did you say in California? <laughs> and you know what? We did it. We did it in November of this year. And we continue to come up with solutions. We continue to elevate, um, and with Christina and her work, uh, to continue to elevate utilizing these food products. But Fabio said something that we all need to pay particular attention to today. And I don't know if these are his words, but I am going to totally steal this. He said, using outputs from one chain as an input for another chain. That's exactly what we did. And that's the solution. When I'm done with this suit, it doesn't mean the suit can't be worn by somebody. I wore the suit because it's my Italian suit, and Massimo will be here soon, and my <laughs> Italian shoes. Um, but we have to keep this going. And, that's the ch and I love what you said. That is just absolutely brilliant. Thank you, Fabio. Thank you. Uh, we, we just have time for a tiny, tiny question because I know, but we need to get ready for the keynote speaker. But if we can also keep the conversations outside the room, we'll have the cocktail. Unfortunately, we have a schedule. Uh, we'll have time for just one tiny question, and then we need 10 minutes to, to reorganize ourselves. I'm really sorry. Uh, grazie, Fabio. Uh, my name is Mario, and I'm a graduate of the Institute of Culinary Education. I'd like to give my gratitude to Mr. Rick Smilo for teaming up with the school. Uh, I, I'd like to see this happen in, in a diverse amount of colleges around the city uh, because I believe that's where the trends go and the education goes going into the future is you, you get the children or the students in the school. So I'd like to see this continue at that level. Uh, maybe Ms. Balkan, as a suggestion, can get the mayor's ear and talk to the school chancellor and do this in, in, in the elementary schools, you know, these kind of things and education. I like the green market uh, becoming into the scene and comp uh, uh, competitiveness is good in, uh, and sort of uh, helps the consumer, make, uh, gives them more choices. Um, what I saw is what I'm aware of as a chef and going around to different food stores and places is that I'm seeing the increase in plastics and aluminum and these are just toxic things in food. Uh, you know, you have a healthy product like a fresh pressed juice and we're using scraps and then it's in a plastic bottle and a lot of that winds up in the Pacific in that dead zone. So I'd like to see more glass use, more paper, uh, things that mimic plastic that are made from food starches and things that break down and they're not toxic when you put them in your mouth. So, um, yeah, so do we see something happening like that uh, in, in and what is the commitment for the, for the panel or when they go back to their people in this area? Yeah, it's a really important point. Um, we don't want the um, enthusiasm around reducing food waste and the advocacy space to cannibalize the work that we're trying to do on zero waste and to achieve a circular economy. So if we're saying that we need um, three more layers of plastic wrap to keep something, fr a, you know, piece of produce fresher longer so that it doesn't get wasted, well, we have to be honest about if that's a trade-off that's really worth it environmentally and in terms of cost. So. Um, you know, reusing materials and reducing material use is um, is absolutely important, and um, and glass is a huge issue for us. And I think, um, you know, a lot of glass doesn't get recycled, or it doesn't get recycled into glass. It um, it, and that's something people don't know. So I think if you have the choice, you know, you should drink your beer out of out of aluminum, you know, or you should buy, uh, you know, a container for your food product that's not 
glass. Glass is a great thing, and it's, um, you know, I have a lot of issues with plastic, so I'm not saying go buy more plastic, but um, you need to think about kind of the full life cycle of all materials and, and make that part of your um, consumption choice. And um, and like I said, I think the food waste issue is, uh, as you know, it can't be, uh, can't obscure the importance of uh, zero waste as a, as a holistic uh, objective and, and how we really achieve the circular economy by getting all of the components in our waste stream identified as resources and commodities. And every time we throw something out, whether it's food or plastic or glass, rather than reusing it, um, what you're doing is you're throwing money down the drain. One sustainability solution that you create cannot create an environmental disaster. But Thomas, that's the whole, that's my question about the waste and water system. Right. Balmore. Yeah. Ask me, what's your question? Well, I just, I think that you're, you're t which is great, everything you've done is amazing, but we're talking about, you know, inputs and outputs and creating another problem. And right. one, of this, one of the solutions you guys use is this waste to water, which essentially right. sends, you know, protein-rich effluent down right. to our wastewater treatment facility, Correct. which has to deal with it. It's not right. being reused, it's not in the soil, it's not being eaten. So I just, I, you know, I, we've worked together on a lot of things. I love what you're doing, but that's a huge piece of this puzzle that I think is misleading when you say we've gone completely organic, zero waste. So I'm not going to lunch with you today. Okay. <laughs> that's out. That's off the table. That is not happening. <laughs> so that's such a great question. Uh, remember, I talked about you know, we keep improving. Our waste to water system was a big part of our solution early on. Before I came to Baldor, we had the largest waste to water system in the United States. I'm pleased to say that system is gone and we've replaced it with a very small system. That system, and I think, Elizabeth, when you were visiting, we still have the big one. The smaller system, actually the only food product we're putting in there now is any food that has hit the floor. We do not capture for animal consumption or human consumption anything that's hit the floor ever. So if a carrot falls off our production line, we don't pick it up and wash it and make a carrot stick out of it. It goes in our waste to water system because we will not feed animals with it. And I look forward to a day when we take that product, maybe we wash it and do something with it, but for now, I haven't seen a good solution for that. But you'll be very happy to know, Elizabeth, that we, that is less than a half of 1% of our food product. So thank you. The other thing, excuse me, we will put on there, if a vegetable shows rot and mold, it goes in our waste to water system. So we don't put that in our animal feed containers either. So thank you. Oh, the, the original question is, why do you use a waste-to-water system on site? Yeah. All right, so we have 10 minutes to stretch our legs. I also wanted to point out that we have the United Nations Development Program outside. They worked on a cookbook connected with climate change. And if you want to talk to them and know more, they're right outside near the registration. And we'll be back here at 1230. Thank you, all the panelists, and see you in 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you.